On today's World Insight with Tian Wei, the Huawei CFO out on bail, the meaning of the extradition case for China, Canada, and the U.S. And in our special series, Witness to History, marking China's reform and opening up, we speak to Professor Lin Yifu about the Chinese economy and the global trade. China now is a high middle income country. Capital is not scarce anymore. And uh, sectors which used to be against China's comparative advantage now become China's comparative advantage. Hello and welcome to World Insight with me, Tian Wei. The program is coming to you live on CGTN. The Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou has been released on bail after Canadian authorities held her nearly two weeks ago at the United States' request. A Canadian court on Tuesday granted Ms. Meng bail of 10 million Canadian dollars. Huawei said it hoped the U.S. and Canada could now end the matter in a fair and timely manner. Ms. Meng's detention grabbed worldwide attention and objections from China. Let's take a look. Huawei's chief financial officer, Meng Wanzhou, said she had been released and was now with her family. The Supreme Court of British Columbia of Canada said Ms. Meng, an educated businesswoman with letters of reference, does not pose a flight risk. She was granted bail of 10 million Canadian dollars, or about 7.5 million U.S. dollars, after hearings concluded Tuesday. Canada held Ms. Meng almost two weeks ago at the request of the United States. The U.S. accused her of fraud related to alleged violations of U.S. sanctions on Iran. The Huawei CFO denied the charges. She's facing possible extradition from Canada to the U.S. Our request is very clear. Canada should correct this wrong practice and clear Meng Wanzhou immediately. The Chinese Foreign Ministry did clarify that two Canadian citizens detained in China this week under the suspicion of endangering China's national security had nothing to do with the Huawei case. The two cases are under investigation. The two agencies have notified the Canadian Embassy in China. We are protecting their legitimate rights. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump has spoken on the case of Ms. Meng, saying he would intervene if he thought it would serve national security interests or help close a trade deal with China. A day after Mr. Trump's comment, the Canadian Foreign Ministry said the extradition process should not be politicized. It's about respecting the rule of law, and our extradition partners should not seek to politicize the extradition process or use it for ends other than the pursuit of justice and following the rule of law. The extradition case of the Huawei CFO has put a damper on relations between China and Canada. So what's next for Meng Wanzhou and what does her extradition case mean for the relations among China, U.S. and Canada? With us in our Beijing studio, Yang Xiyu, who is a senior research fellow from the China Institute of International Studies. Sir, welcome to our program. Also joining us in the studio here in Beijing, Rick Dunham, co-director of the Global Business Journalism Program from Tsinghua University. He used to be a Washington correspondent. And in Ottawa, we have uh, Wen Ran Jiang, senior fellow at the Institute for Asian Research of the School of Public Policy from University of British Columbia. Welcome to three of you, gentlemen for joining us. Uh, uh, Professor Jiang, let me go to you first. So she's out, yet on bail. What's next? Well, the next is that we wait. <laughs> um, this is a preliminary uh, arrest a request for potential extradition uh, to the United States. And yet, the American side uh, need to submit formal evidence to the Canadian side within 60 days. So within a couple of months, uh, if American uh, formal extradition request and accompanying evidence arrives in, uh, in Canada, and then the Canadian court will look whether uh, they meet the Canadian 
U.S. extradition standards, uh, which have a number of uh, clauses, uh, including whether it actually constitutes also a crime in Canada, potentially. It's a dual criminality clause. The other one is whether the charge or the request from the United States is politically motivated. Uh, so we're looking at a fairly long proceeding if the state as we see it now continues. Mm. Mr. Jiang, before we go to the other guests, I have to follow up a little bit. Uh, if the U.S. Yep. is putting forward the so-called extradition request formally with what they called as evidence, yep. and as you said, the Canadian side will try to decide whether that is a politicized case or not. But uh, Professor Jiang, many here in China at least have been asking the question that the Canadian side, even though with the extradition agreement between Canada and the U.S., without much concrete evidence, at least evidence that could be shown to the public yet, already arrested her, and obviously there have been quite some zigzagging over the past two weeks. So people are wondering whether Canada's role has been quite tricky this time. Well, uh, it is quite tricky only under the very, very high profile and the media attention and somehow the Chinese protest as well as the uh, President Trump's uh, interview and mentioning this could be a deal um, between China uh, and the United States on trade. Traditionally, this is a very standard U.S.-Canada bilateral treaty obligation saying if you do have a criminal of some kind, either citizens of the uh, 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 two countries or others who are violating the laws of one of the two countries, they can extradite. This has been in place for a long time. And the request would be in the procedure that the warrant for arrest comes first and then the evidence and hearing comes later. Yes, the uh, Chinese uh, uh, government and the general public does not see this as fair process, rounding up a Chinese citizen, uh, not directly having evidence of uh, violating Canadian uh, laws uh, and therefore um, uh, requesting the immediate release. Mm. The Canadian side, on the other hand, saying sorry, this is just like a general normal procedure we've been doing it for decades. And so therefore, we're stuck in a dilemma. Uh, and it, of course, it goes beyond uh, just the, this right. case itself, whether the bilateral treaty extradition can actually apply to a Chinese citizen is being disputed now. We're going to go to that uh, so-called caught in between part uh, discussion about Canada's role in the future, particularly uh, Professor Jiang. Thank you for your explanation. Coming to you, Mr. Yang, mm -hmm. several things. Um, obviously, it is very clear that China and the U.S. are apparently in a trade war. Yep. Secondly, Huawei has always been a company receiving high-profile attention, yes. not to mention a CFO who is the daughter of Wonder. the founder of Huawei. Yeah. And uh, the Canadian side, one would assume they certainly understand all of these uh, uh, significances when the decision was being made, even though it is being portrayed in a way as a common practice by the Canadian side so far. Yep. So, uh, Mr. Yang, how do you see this tricky situation now for Canada, particularly, mm -hmm. but also for the United States as to whether the latter will provide what they call so-called evidence to the Canadian side? Well, I think uh, currently uh, China was uh, China's uh, citizen uh, was humili humiliated. Uh, that's the current picture. However, in the middle and the long run, uh, both Canada and the U.S. will fall in a very ugly dilemma. For Canada, let's say if if U.S. fail to uh, submit the official uh, extradition request with hard evidences, and uh, what Canada can do release Ms. Meng. But what's the excuse to arrest? You know, 
it was detain, not, yeah, to yeah, detain her from yeah, the very yeah, beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is Canada, not the U.S., to detain, to have detained right. Ms. Meng. And it's the, uh, Canada released Ms. Meng. So what is the reason for detain? What's the reason for release? Mm. All the reason comes from the United, United States, not from the Canada. So that's a political, a big and ugly dilemma for Canada. Mm. And for the United States, if the U.S. say, okay, you violated some law, and I have, uh, I have seen many uh, uh, documents, it's quite controversial. So I can say when Ms. Meng uh, uh, was be, uh, 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 is uh, requested to be exercised, uh -huh. and that would be a long, long court debate, maybe years. And that's not uh, abnormal in, in Canada's legal history, right. right? So maybe eight years, ten years even. Uh, my so what are you trying to say here? And uh, I, what I want to say is this case will go nowhere. So in the high profile, you as a launch this legal war. And uh, with a v uh, meaningless end. Right. So that is the U.S. dilemma. Okay. He, they will fail. Face. Uh, well, of course, everybody has different opinions. Uh, right. Mr. Duncan, you are also entitled to your opinions. I mean, right. one of the things is uh, the U.S. president apparently coming out and suggesting he could intervene if that is uh, are going to be, in his words, uh, uh, making it possible for the so-called bilateral trade deal, which seems to be a little bit tricky the way he put it. Of course, uh, uh, the U.S. president has always been tricky the way he puts <laughs> many things, but this time particularly because this is really all about legal cases. Everything changed when Donald Trump opened his mouth. Uh, in this case, yes, he, he admitted by saying he could intervene to free her uh, as part of trade negotiations with China, he is admitting that this case is political and not legal. Mm. And that's why the Foreign Minister of Canada was so angry. You, you, saw, it all, you saw her a couple of minutes ago. Right. Uh, this, the, this is supposed to be a legal process. And uh, it's been opaque in that she doesn't know what the evidence is against her. U.S. hasn't re released publicly the evidence why she should be held. It's a question of trust us. Now, yes, there may be evidence that Huawei violated Iran sanctions. And we there, don't know. It and might, and, and, it may not and be. it might not be exactly. She may yeah. have lied to investors uh, about it, and she might not have. We don't know. The problem is that the context of the entire case changed mm. when Donald Trump suggested that he can manipulate his Justice Department. The Justice Department is supposed to be the blind woman with the scales of justice. It's not supposed to be Donald Trump on his smartphone tweeting out that he's going to he's We do going not to want to forget the fact that earlier there were administration officials coming out and suggesting, denying that President Trump was aware of this right. case when the trade discussion between China and the United right. States was going on just a few weeks ago, right. which was quite crucial for China and the U.S. to work together for the next stage of coming to whether or not there's a deal uh, and, and what to deal about. Uh, so that is adding an extra layer of things not necessarily related to legality at all, but rather uh, politics uh, from the very beginning. I think even in personal relations, remember he was having dinner with President Xi Jinping in Buenos Aires as some of this was going down. He didn't mention it. Uh, now it's an open question. Did he know about it or did he not know about it? I think in this case it's bad for Donald Trump either way. Either he knew about it and didn't tell President Xi Jinping or he was out of the loop when mm. there was a case that was so important to bilateral relations. All right. And, and Professor Jiang, over the past two weeks, uh, we have seen a lot of debates going on here in China about, you know, what to do about China-U.S. trade disputes and things. Uh, things have been quieting down and people are coming to further senses when it comes to uh, the meeting bilateral between the two presidents. But obviously this is putting water into the boiling oil, as the Chinese say, this specific case. Particularly from the Chinese business community, Professor Jiang, that Many are wondering whether their legal uh, business practices 
particularly cross-border, particularly between China and the North American countries, let's just say China, Canada, and China, United States, are likely to be legally protected as they should be or not anymore. This is adding huge amount of anxiety to the business community and therefore likely to hurt economies as mentioned in all these countries. Professor Jiang. Well, this case actually, uh, it is really an escalation by the um, U.S. side because we know there were previous cases that one of the Chinese companies, Zhongxing uh, uh, ZTE in English, uh, that was convicted uh, uh, of violating U.S. sanctions against Iran, but it was a, a civil in, uh, litigation mm. handled by the U.S. Department of Commerce, which was actually successfully uh, settled with uh, ZTE paying a fine, uh, it's back to business. Instead of following that precedent, uh, this time they pursue a senior executive, an individual for responsibilities, potentially responsibilities, uh, for violating U.S. sanctions against Iran. It's quite a uh, unprecedented situation because many U.S. companies and other international companies similarly violated U.S. sanctions against Iran, uh, but they're held primarily responsible by the corporate entity rather than a senior executive right. uh, to be arrested in such a manner. And therefore, across the board in North America, around the world, they're looking at this case. Uh, there's an outcry saying you can't do this uh, and open up such a precedent. And therefore, the Chinese executives who are doing cross-border business in the United States and Canada, they fly back and forth. Many people are having homes, like Ms. Meng's case in Vancouver, in Toronto. They come, they go. Now they wonder whether at one of their trips in North America mm. uh, would be safe or whether it would be just picked up due to some kind of corporate dispute. Right. The reverse is true, though, I want to mention. The Canadians now are beginning to get nervous because two of the Canadians are being rounded up, arrested, so they get ne nervous for traveling to China as well. So it's not a good sign when we have a situation like this. Mm. I want to have Mr. Yang to respond to that. According to the Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson, uh, these two cases of Canadians being arrested here in China are due to national security reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and according to the Chinese side, the Chinese side has been in close contact with the Canadian embassy mm -hmm. in China about these two individuals and their rights are being protected. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, people have been linking these cases, particularly if you see the media reports. But uh, Mr. Yang, how do you see the nature of these two so-called cases vis-a-vis uh, -vis that of Ms. Meng? Well, uh, no linkage uh, at all between the two cases. However... That's what uh, the Chinese Foreign Ministry said. Uh, well, uh, it, it is the fact, no linkage. But, uh, as, uh, uh, as Professor Jiang mentioned, uh, in Iran case, in the United States, many, uh, uh, quite uh, several uh, companies violating, but not every company's senior executive was arrested, mm -hmm. right? So, in China, I would say uh, many such cases is violating Chinese uh, national security. However, at this timing, at this point, uh, the two Canadians uh, were arrested uh, really have some meaning relating to the case. Say, uh, Ms. Meng is, un, uh, is unfairly treated in, in Canada, uh, illegally treated, and we act according to Chinese legal uh, uh, system. So no linkage, but the timing really means some linkage between the two. Say, uh, we, we right. can arrest this guy or that guy, but we select this guy because uh, the fact, the, the basis uh, violating the law. But uh, choose who, choose whom, really means something uh, relating to the uh, uh, timing. Uh, Mr. Dunham, so what does this mean? further developing the story itself. Um, we have seen temptations coming from Washington, among some groups at least, to so-called decouple China, 
and the United States. Despite of the fact this is a globalized world and the two economies are very intertwined. Uh, and certainly the case of Ms. Meng and the way the case was being handled mm -hmm. certainly would raise further concern from the Chinese side, different sides of the society, about whether the other side is trying to seek decoupling rather than solving mm -hmm. the problems as the other side earlier put it. Uh, Mr. Dunham, to you, how should we understand this? Well, I'll start by saying I don't think it's productive to just start grabbing people, I mean, citizens from other countries. Um, whether there's a relationship between the Canadians being taken into custody and Ms. Meng uh, being taken into custody is really irrelevant. It's just, it's, it, they both, both countries acted within the laws of their countries, but it's counterproductive. And I, I think the bigger issue here is to criminalize corporate behavior and to, to uh, the difference, as we talked about, between uh, civil actions involving corporations and grabbing executives, putting them in jail. Uh, and I really don't think that the justice system of any country, whether it's Donald Trump saying he could control the justice system in the U.S. or something right. in China, is going to help. It's, it's, it's going to add to tensions. And I, I, I don't think coupling or decoupling uh, yeah, will will be a result. Mm. Uh, Professor Zhang, I will ask you also from a different direction. Canada has always been struggling through decades, and that is not an exaggeration about where to go when it comes to its policies and directions with with the United States. And Canada has always been trying to seek different kinds of possibilities about trade, economic ties, at other than just Washington itself. China, of course, is a good option for Canada, together with other economies as well. Professor Zhang, now, what kind of thinking process Ottawa needs to go through in order to make sensible choices about the current situation and for years to come, if they really want to make a decision? Well, that is actually a quite good question. Here in Canada, people are debating about it for years, for decades. Uh, for our viewers, uh, that they should know, Canada is very dependent on the United States. The two countries are very integrated. 75% of um, Canada's trade uh, is with the United States. Uh, nearly 100% of our oil, oil and gas uh, exporting to the United States market. China, even ranking as the second largest trading partner uh, with Canada, is only occupying about 7% mm. of the Canadian economy. That being said, uh, Canada has been seeking for diversification, especially towards Asia, towards China, because China is now the largest uh, growing market in the world uh, for a long time. Uh, so the debate is whether uh, Canada should diversify to what extent it should diversify and but the relationship with the United States remains strong not only because some people advocate that strong relationship mm. they also think we really don't have much choice and so therefore it All puts right. Canada into a delicate situation on how to deal with China and the United States in the current situation so this debate is ongoing and we don't know where uh, it's heading next. We want to divers diversify, we can't do much about it either. All right. Complicated situation. Every country has their own things that they have to deal with, but they have to be clear minded at critical points, particularly. Thank you so much, the three of you gentlemen, for being with us. Uh, uh, Zhang Wenran, Rick Dunham, and last but not least, Yang Xu. Thank you. And you're watching World Insight with me, Tian Wei, still to come on our program. In today's edition of Witness to History to mark China's reform and opening up 40th anniversary, we speak to Professor Lin Yifu, the World Bank's former chief economist and also a very well-known Chinese economist about the global troubles of trade as well as the Chinese economy. That interview right after this break.
Welcome back. You're still watching World Insight. I'm Tian Wei. The program is coming to you Monday to Friday live on CGTN. This week, we bring you our special series, Witness to History, featuring insiders who took part in China's reform and opening up process. Today, let's meet Professor Justin Lin Yifu, the former World Bank chief economist and director of the Center for New Structural Economics at the Peking University. Forty years after reform and opening up, China has grown into one of the world's leading economies. But challenges and problems persist. On top of the list is the trade war between China and the United States. The meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Donald Trump took place on the sidelines of this year's G20 summit. Their candid exchange did bring brighter prospects for the two sides on some fronts. But more still needs to be done to fix trade frictions. Lin shared with us his insights on trade tensions and how the country's economy would fare in uncertain times. Professor Lin, welcome to CGTN. Good morning, Wei. One of the things people are asking is about the global supply chain. Where is China going to be as a result of this apparent trade war between China and the United States on the global supply chain? The trade world currently, what we observe, will affect the kind of process. And especially, China is a major producer of manufacturing goods in the world. So China get a nickname of the world factory. And uh, this kind of modern manufacturing rely on supply chain. So if this trade war prolonged, certainly it will hurt a little bit. But China is a large country. So the impact will be there, but I think it will be observable. And I think as we said, we hope for the best, but we prepare for the worst. How is China prepared for the worst? Well, certainly China has a lot of uh, domestic you know, demand, and uh, we can rely on domestic demand to absorb some of this you know, diversion. And uh, China also trade with European country, Africa, South Asia, Central Asia, East Asia. And uh, so, you know, the world is only between China and the U.S., but we have so many friends in the world. Mm. And uh, we can, you know, work together to arrange, you know, uh, globalization, even without the participation of the U.S. The trade war, when it comes to the amount or the quantity is one thing, but the most important thing is what's going to be the nature of the relationship between China and the United States, the two largest economies in the right. world, and therefore what does it mean for the world economy as a whole. Meanwhile, it is also about confidence, the confidence believing in globalization, the confidence about the global economy in the future. Yeah. About that part, is there any evidence Professor Lian, helping us to understand where things are going. I think that uh, because we need to see the foundation of relation. The foundation of relation is that where this relation help each other, improve the living of the people in both country, and uh, fulfill the dream of the people in both country. And uh, I strongly believe, yes, that's the foundation. Our productions. Our industries are in the low, medium, value-added sectors. Yes. And the U.S. is on the high-value you know, added sectors. And so our economy comes to complementarity. That means we, you know, in a trade, we export you know, low prices, different necessity, consumption goods to help the consumers. Trade is still a win-win because in uh, the mechanism of trade, when countries are on a different income level, okay. they are based on the different competitive advantages. China has competitive advantage in multiple intensive sectors, and the U.S. has competitive advantage on higher value added capital intensive sectors. But when our income reaches the same level, then trade will rely on specialization. So trade will always be good for everyone. And that is the reason why globalization has been a trend in the world. Mm. And uh, that allows that every country to have an opportunity to improve the efficiency of their economy and, and uh, you know, 
update the different standard of their people. We understand there are certain concerns, let's just say, in Washington. But the question is, when China is developing and we see discomfort in some other places as a result of purely China's development, what can China do, really? If China grow, China's market will be larger, and China also provide opportunity for other countries to share this kind of prosperity, because we are in a globalized world. When China grow, China demand for high value added, sophisticated manufacturing good will also increase. Mm -hmm. China's you know, demand for luxury consumption good will be increased. So from what I see, you know, the rise of China or the growth of China certainly first it's a legitimate you know, right for Chinese people. Certainly it's also a legitimate right for the people in every country. Mm. And in a globalized world, this kind of dynamic growth in one country not only help the country itself, but will also help the other country to have a larger markets and to grow together. Mm. So I think we should that people understand it's our common interest. And so, you know, we can join hands to share this pr pr prosperity together. Mm. Robert Zolik, who you used to work with when you were serving for the uh, World Bank, yeah. was suggesting that we should look beyond the current administration in Washington and look at the real nature yeah. of the economies between the two countries yeah. and the nature of relationship between the two countries. Yeah. Professor Lian, how can we look beyond when you have quite an obstacle right here? What kind of vision does it take for Chinese economic policy makers and academics such as you which is leading the thoughts about China's development here in this country. You know, we should do what we need to do to further reforming our economy, to improve the, our system, and so when you know, we become higher income country, we all have a good foundation, good institution for you know, operation of our system to meet the aspiration of the people. Yes. I think that's a fundamental thing. No matter what kind of situation happen you know, outside China, we should not you know, throw down what we need to do. When it comes to China, the biggest challenge is not coming from outside China, but rather how China upgrades itself. Right. So that comes to the reform and the opening up issue. Yeah. Professor Lian, you've been instrumental in pushing forward China's reform and interaction with the rest of the world. But Professor Lian, there have been complaints about China not necessarily acting fast, not necessarily acting according to its promises over the years, particularly when it comes to the opening part. Um, what do you say, Professor? You know, we should not, you know, judge uh, the reform programs according to some kind of blueprint based on textbook, mm -hmm. right? Because certainly China adop adopted a gradual piecemeal approach mm -hmm. for the transition. And uh, in the 1980s, 1990s, the idea of transition from a planned economy to a market economy is to adopt some kind of comprehensive uh, shock therapy to remove all the distortions yes. simultaneously. And at that time, there seemed to be a consensus among the policy and the academic, academic circles in the world. And at that time, the idea that to have a piecemeal gradual approach was the worst possible approach. But uh, that, let's see the evidence. Country adopt those kind of comprehensive shock therapy, try to do privatization, marketization, stabilization, liberalization simultaneously. On the paper, they seem to, you know, introduce the perfect institution, perfect <laughs> system. Yes. But their economy collapsed, stagnant, hit by crisis all the time, and their economic performance measured by the average annual growth rate. It was lower than pre-transition. 
if you measure by the frequencies of crises, again, it was higher than the pre uh, pre transition. Yes. And so, those kind of so called improved uh, you know, institution simultaneously to reach the higher level, it did not contribute to the well being of the people. And China adopted this kind of gradual piecemeal approach. You know, on the one hand, continue to provide some transitory protection and subsidy to the old capital intensive sector, which went against China's comparative advantages. Mm -hmm. By that, China maintains stability. But on the other hand, also liberalize the entry to the new labor intensive sectors, which China you know, had comparative advantages. And uh, government facilitated that by improving infrastructure based environment in the special economic zone, export processing zone. So quickly turn those kind of competitive advantage to competitive advantage. That's right. So China can grow so fast. And not only so, the dynamic growth in the new sectors also create a condition mm -hmm. to reform the older sectors. Because the reason why the older sector require protection and subsidies was because they win against China's comparative advantage. At that time, China was a low income country, capital was scarce but they were in a very capital uh, intensive sectors. That's right. And they are not viable in an open competitive market. But after 40 years of reform, China now is a high middle income country, capital is not scarce anymore, and uh, sectors which used to be against China's comparative advantage now become China's comparative advantages. But then that means we could do it faster, uh, Professor? Well, that has to see because, you know, if we can do faster, certainly it will be desirable. But stability is always the foundation. One of the things people are concerned these days is what's going to happen to the international system. Yeah. You yourself worked in the World Bank for yeah. consecutive years. When the developed economy, particularly the United States and the current administration, expressing so much suspicions and even intention to withdraw from some of the international institutions, what can China, as biggest developing country in the emerging economy, together with the others, do about the current reality. Can China and some of the others figure out some kinds of solutions in order to make sure that people still have confidence in the international system and confidence in our global economy, Professor? Well, I think that's a very important issue. As I say, globalization is a win-win for everyone. And after the Second World War, the international architectures, you know, is, has paved the foundation for globalization. And I think the challenge is not globalization is not good. Hmm. The challenge is that China, you know, benefit from this globalization, China grow very fast. And uh, now the weight in the global economy shifts. And, uh, but if we turn away from globalization, other developing countries, they will you know, lose the opportunity to have a dynamic economic growth as China. And uh, so I think the globalization and the international architecture after the Second World War provide a possibility for that. Yeah. And especially, you know, with now China become a newcomer in global development community, provide a system to other developing countries and order to enable them to capture the opportunity of you know, globalization. I think the globalization is you know, a platform for every country to develop their economy according to their competitive advantages and by that they can be efficient. Mm. And at the same time, it also provides an opportunity for country to transform from poor agrarian economy to modern industrialized economy and climb the industrial ladder to you know, move from low income, middle income to high income. Mm -hmm. And in this process, for a low income country, two things are crucial. One is to capture the window of opportunity of global relocation of labor intensive manufacturing. Yes. And the second one is to 
you know, create enabling condition for country to capture that opportunities. And in this, you know, entering to this new era, China will become a high income country, China will lose competitive advantages in traditional labor intensive sectors, and uh, those kind of sectors will be uh, on the process to be relocated to other countries. Mm -hmm. And because China is a large country, right. China has 85 million in a job opportunity in those kind of sectors. And that 85 million will be almost possible to make all the low income country to kickstart their industrialization simultaneously. Mm -hmm. But the mining constraint is infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Because if you want to have your goods to reach global markets, you need your power, you need your role, you need your port facility. And China's Bay and Road Initiative will you know, contribute to the infrastructure connectivities. So I think that. Uh, you know, the developing countries should work together to, you know, capture this opportunity. And uh, if the developing country can grow faster, they will become the larger market for high-income country. Right. And that will enable high-income country to continue to maintain higher growth and achieve, you know, further prosperity. Even if that means more disputes at the WTO, even the deadlock at the WTO, even that means World Bank, INF express concerns or suspicions about China's goals when it comes to future development through the globalization. China is still going to stick to its version of globalization. Is Certainly. that what you're saying? Certainly. Yeah. As simple as that. Yeah. Thank you so much, Professor okay. Lin, for being with us. Okay. Really appreciate it. And that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Inside CTTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo from Mi Tianwei and everyone on the World Inside team. Thanks for watching and tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.